On which Stirling Castle is built, Castle Hill forms part of the Stirling Sill, a quartz dolerite formation created around 350 million years ago. The first record of Stirling Castle dates from around 1110, when King Alexander I dedicated a chapel and the king died here in 1124. During the reign of his successor, David I, Stirling became a royal borough. King William I formed a deer park southwest of the castle. Still, after his capture by the English in 1174, he was forced to surrender several castles, including Stirling and Edinburgh Castle, under the Treaty of Falaise. There is no evidence that the English occupied the castle, which was formally handed back by Richard I of England in 1189. Stirling continued to be a favoured royal residence, with William dying there in 1214, and Alexander III laying out the new park for deer hunting in the 1260s. In 1296, Edward I of England invaded Scotland, beginning the Wars of Scottish Independence, which would last for the next 60 years. The English found Stirling Castle abandoned and empty and occupied it. They were dislodged the following year after the victory of Andrew Moray and William Wallace at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Many of the garrison were killed during the battle, after which the English commanders William Fitzwarren and Marmaduke Thwing retreated into the castle. However, they were quickly starved into surrender by the Scots. The castle returned to English hands again following an English victory at Falkirk. Edward this time strengthened the castle, but it was besieged in 1299 by forces including Robert Bruce. King Edward failed to relieve the garrison, who were forced to surrender. Edward's army returned in April 1304 with at least 17 siege engines. The Scots under William Oliphant surrendered on the 20th of July. Still, Edward ordered part of the garrison back into the castle as he had not yet deployed his latest engine, Warwolf. Warwolf is believed to have been a giant trebuchet that destroyed the castle's gatehouse. Edward died in 1307 and Robert Bruce was now King of Scots. By 1313, the English held only Stirling, Roxburgh, Edinburgh and Berwick castles. Edward Bruce, the king's brother, laid siege to Stirling held by Sir Philip Mowbray. After several months, Mowbray agreed that he would surrender the castle if it were not relieved within one year by the English. Edward Bruce agreed and withdrew. The following summer, the English, led by Edward II, returned to save the castle, but they were defeated at the Battle of Bannockburn within sight of the castle walls. The resulting English defeat was decisive. King Edward attempted to take refuge in the castle but Mowbray was determined to keep to his word, and the English were forced to flee. And Mowbray handed over the castle, changing sides himself in the process. King Robert ordered the castle to have its defences destroyed to prevent an English reoccupation. The Second War of Scottish Independence saw the English in control of Stirling Castle by 1336, and extensive works were carried out, still mainly in timber rather than stone. Another Scottish siege was attempted in 1337, but Robert Stuart, the future King Robert II, retook Stirling in a blockade from 1341 to 1342. In 1360, Robert de Forsyth was appointed Governor of Stirling Castle, an office he passed on to his son, John and grandson William, who was Governor in 1399. Under the Stuart monarchy, the castle was constructed between 1490 and 1600. Stirling was developed as a principal royal centre by the Stuart kings James IV, James V and James VI. In December 1593, Anne of Denmark decided to come to Stirling for the birth of her first child. James ordered the palace, which was in ruin and decay, to be repaired, and the present chapel royal was constructed. The Stuarts remained at the castle until the Union of the Crowns of 1603, when James VI became King of England and the royal family left for London. After their departure, Stirling became principally a military centre. It was used as a prison for persons of rank during the 17th century and saw few visits by the monarch. 
Much work was carried out to restore the castle in preparation for the return of James, who stayed in Stirling during July 1617. From 1625, extensive preparations were made for the anticipated visit of the new king, Charles I, who did not come to Scotland until 1633 and only stayed in the castle briefly. Following the execution of Charles I, the Scots crowned his son Charles II, and he became the last reigning monarch to stay here, living at the castle in 1650. The royalist forces were defeated at Dunbar by those of Oliver Cromwell, and the king marched south to defeat at Worcester. General Monk laid siege to the castle on 6th of August 1651, erecting gun platforms in the adjacent churchyard. After the garrison mutinied, they were obliged to surrender on 14th August. Damage done during the siege can still be seen in the church and the Great Hall. After the restoration of the monarchy, the castle was used as a prison, and its military importance was recognised by the installation of a powder magazine, and a formal garrison was installed in 1685. The Jacobite Rising of 1745 saw Charles Edward Stuart lead his army of Highlanders past Stirling on the way to Edinburgh. Following the Jacobites' retreat from England, they returned to Stirling in January 1746. The town soon surrendered, but the castle governor refused to capitulate. Artillery works were set up on Gowan Hill, but were quickly destroyed by the castle's guns. The Jacobites withdrew north on the 1st of February. From 1800, the War Office owned the castle and ran it as a barracks. Many alterations were made to the Great Hall, an accommodation block, to the Chapel Royal, a lecture theatre and dining hall, to the King's Old Building, an infirmary, and to the Royal Palace, which became the officers' mess. Several new buildings were also constructed, including the prison and powder magazine at the Never Bailey in 1810. Queen Victoria visited in 1842 and the Prince of Wales in 1859. The military occupation officially ended in 2014 with its last troops removed to Redford Barracks in Edinburgh, although Stirling Castle remains the official headquarters of the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders. With a history such as Stirling Castle, it is no surprise that many ghosts haunt it, and for those of you interested in all things paranormal, here is a collection of tales from the castle. The ghost of the Green Lady is the most famous that lingers in Stirling. One evening she delayed dinner in the officer's mess when she materialised behind the chef preparing the meal for the soldiers. Feeling he was being watched, he turned around, only to see her green, translucent form standing behind him, at which time he fainted. She vanished on this occasion, but her appearances are usually a harbinger of bad things to come. Her visits have occurred shortly before fires or other mishaps at the castle. There are different tales of her origin, but the one that stems from some historical evidence is that she was a young Highland girl who attended the castle as a servant of Mary, Queen of Scots. She was said to be highly superstitious and convinced that a terrible fate would befall Mary on the night of 13 September 1561. The story goes that the girl was sure a terrible fire would break out in Mary's room at the castle. She vowed to remain awake all night to guard the Queen, but couldn't quite manage it. She accidentally lit the Queen's bed curtains with a candle in her drowsiness. The Queen survived, but the poor girl fell victim to her vision and died that night in the fire. One final story associated with the Green Lady is entirely different. In this tale, the woman is not a maidservant, but the daughter of the castle's commander, who fell in love with one of the castle's soldiers. Her father discovered the affair and, in a fit of rage, shot the soldier down, driving his heartbroken daughter to throw herself off the battlements to her death and perhaps haunt the castle for eternity. Battlements used to surmount the governor's block in the upper square of the castle. In the 1820s, castle sentries walking along the battlements used to report hearing strange sights and sounds. One night, a sentry on his way to start his guard duty came across the body of the guardsman he was on his way to replace. The guardsman was dead at his post, his mouth wide open with a look of sheer horror. 
Over the next few decades, the sentry duty was halted and the battlements dismantled, leaving only an angled roof. Alarmingly, in the room directly below, footsteps were still heard walking along the ceiling as though the sentry was still making his rounds. The footsteps were heard on three different occasions, once in 1946 and twice more a decade later, by other officers of the Argyll and Sutherlands. In all three events, it was very unnerving when all involved realised there was nowhere for anyone to walk up there with the battlements long gone. The ghost of a pink lady sometimes can be seen leaving the castle and walking to the neighbouring church of the Holy Rood at Ladies Rock. This was an elevated location where the ladies of the court would go to watch knights participate in jousting tournaments. Some believe the Pink Lady is the ghost of the sole survivor of Edward I's siege of the castle in 1304. Having escaped the siege, she returns to the castle to find her slain husband. However, her spirit is seen leaving the castle, not entering. There is also a male ghost dressed in a highland kilt, often seen turning a corner and disappearing through a doorway near the dungeon. A spirit indeed as the doorway he walks through is a now solid stone wall, having been bricked up for decades. There is said to be a black lady who haunts the back walk. Not much about her is known or why she lingers in this spot. However, it is said she creates a foreboding atmosphere for anyone wandering the path at night. In the 1930s, an architect friend of the castle governor, Lieutenant General Sir Humphrey Gale, took a study photograph of the upper close the archway linking the 16th century royal apartment buildings with the Great Hall, built by James VI. The image appears to be the shadow of a kilted figure walking through the archway. The unnamed photographer is said to have gifted the image to Sir Humphrey. Our history and tour of the castle's spectral inhabitants has ended and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already done so, and of course hit the bell icon for any fresh updates.